first um, ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what their area of focus is in the fintech space. And I'll just go uh, down the order in which I see you on the screen. So Philippe, can you begin? Yeah, of course. So uh, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm um, the uh, global head of uh, fintech and uh, crypto at uh, Sheffield House, and also heading the global functions uh, practice uh, for uh, for Europe. And when it comes to the fintech space, we um, we work with fintechs at different stages of maturity. But uh, obviously, given that it's executive search and that there's a, a certain level of fees involved. Uh, we tend to work with uh, publicly listed uh, fintechs and uh, more mature ones, Series C uh, onwards. And we work on any kind of um, searches uh, um, for um, function roles, uh, CFO, CROs, um, um, tech uh, leaders, uh, CEOs, obviously, uh, as well as global head of sales. Um, and when it comes to fintech verticals, we cover uh, all fintech verticals, um, but um, I think, uh, and also I'm a big fan of uh, B2B fintechs, uh, to be honest. So um, we have a special focus on B2B. Um, other than that, um, you know, wealth techs, uh, neo banks, um, uh, lending platforms, um, every vertical in the fintech world is, is potentially a vertical that is interesting for us. Great. And uh, if each of you could say what country you're in, but I know you have a global responsibility, so Philippe. Um, yeah, I'm based in Switzerland, uh, but I'm absolutely not focusing exclusively on Switzerland. Uh, we work on mandates uh, in uh, in Europe, in the US, in Asia. Um, it doesn't really make a difference for us. Beautiful. And then Chris, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me today, Karen. My name is Chris Panelitas, and I head up EMA's Global Payments and FinTech Practice Group. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I also lead our North American FinTech group and co-lead our technology practice in North America. We work with name brands that everybody would know uh, on the Fortune 500 list. And we also work with small to mid-size PE-backed and founder-led firms across the FinTech ecosystem. We work on exclusively C-level roles, uh, again, across all functional areas. Um, and we do do a lot of work mainly in product, technology, risk management, and, uh, and fraud analytics and AI. Um, those have been very, very active areas uh, for us over the course of the last couple of years. I'm based in New York and I cover the globe. Um, I'd say half of my portfolio is, uh, is in the US and the other half is, uh, is across the other countries. Okay, thanks, Chris and Manuela. Thanks for having me. My name is Manuela and I'm partner at Hydrogen Struggles. I'm part of our international FinTech crew and I'm based in Germany, covering not only Germany, but the focus is definitely on German speaking area and Europe. Um, we are focusing on sea level roles within, I would say, broader fintechs. Okay, terrific. So as everyone in this listening in um, can tell, we have an excellent group of people from all over the world, but also with a global perspective that they bring to this discussion. So again, as you listen in, please do ask questions. And let me just begin with the first question, uh, which is that uh, FinTech is an area that has seen, um, it's seen growth, it's seen disruption, it's seen change. Uh, what's the current overall demand for talent? So Chris, why don't you start us off? Sure. So I would say for us, what we're seeing is product and technology remain the high demand areas. There's a growing demand for highly specialized expertise and skills in AI, machine learning, uh, as well as cybersecurity, data science, cloud engineering, uh, risk, and uh, and fraud. Um, an increase in in the need for data scientists and uh, analysts as fintechs rely heavily on data to make informed decisions. So we're seeing a lot of activity there. Obviously, compliance and regulatory experts are also really active areas as companies are increasingly having to navigate a growing need for more legal and regulatory oversight. Perhaps a less obvious trend is a rise in activity in the field of HR as companies grapple with the challenge of building, uh, or sorry, bringing people back into the office post COVID and also frequently 
uh, HR has to deal with companies that are reorging, restructuring, refining, and retooling their internal talent. Okay, great. And by the way, uh, I'll be rotating who goes first and who goes last each time because the last one is always the challenge to come up with something fresh. And so for this question, um, Anuela, if you can be second. Sure. So uh, I think we can sum it up with um, three main di directions, I would say. Um, first of all, for the more mature fintechs um, that do have the need to establish the regulatory framework or uh, to react on new regulatory requirements, we see the demand for executives in regulatory roles, compliance, AML, and things like that. Then second, um, I already mentioned that I'm based in Germany, so Germany is still very interesting for international fintechs coming to Germany, to Berlin, as Berlin is a fintech hub here. So we see definitely a strong demand still for country heads, for international fintechs coming, uh, coming to Germany. That's, I would say, the second direction. And the third direction, of course, um, looking a bit on what has happened in the last few months and years, um, if you have a change in control, so if you, if, if you have another investor investing in the company, we often see um, after the change of control, the change of the management. I would say these are the three main directions we're working on. Okay, and Philippe, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that question in terms of what you're saying? Okay, so I'll be the one trying to come up with something fresh. Um, yeah, so first, I agree with a lot of what uh, Chris and Manuela have said. Maybe on the macro view, um, I think, you know, there, there, there's a few drivers of um, executive recruitments in the fintech world, but broadly speaking, there is a strong correlation between fundraising activity and executive recruitment, broadly speaking. Huh? Um, and, um, you know, if you look at fintechs, the reason why they raise funds um, um, and grow in size and complexity, um, um, well, well, that leads to uh, basically, um, you know, uh, hires of key executives, um, replacement of C-levels, sometimes a complete replacement of the founding team, etc. And to be honest, that's also one of the ways we identify, you know, a new potential client. You know, we look at the, just the list of uh, substantial funding rounds and, um, you know, when they are funding rounds above uh, 50, 100, 150 million, etc. It's a potential new client. Um, so, I mean, to answer your question, uh, this, right now, things are not as crazy as they used to be in 2021, where the turning around activity will, will really reach the peak. Uh, the fundraising activity will really reach the peak. But I think things are picking up quite nicely. And um, we've been completing uh, uh, quite a few mandates uh, and uh, existing team builds, um, especially in the B2B space, as well, I was mentioning before, because I think that's probably um, one of the spaces that is the most promising uh, going forward and where the economics uh, work quite well for, uh, for fintechs. Um, and and then in terms of special function roles um, where where we see traction, I think it really depends on the fintech vertical. Huh? Um, you know, just giving one example in crypto with what has happening has been happening in the US uh, recently. If you're a compliance person, uh, probably uh, you know uh, you're in high demand, uh, or a risk person, or a legal person, for instance, probably you're in high demand. So you know there are those a bit like specifics. Uh, uh, sort of trends, but are really related uh, to one fintech vertical. And you, you have, you know, crypto, uh, I mean, compliance and risk and legal people in crypto is one example, but you have many others in, in the other fintech verticals. Um, so that's actually a good segue to my, my next question, which is, in fact, what are the big trends uh, that you've seen over the last few years? And so, um, you know, building on that, um, Manuela. Um, sure. So looking back, I would say um, in the last five to eight years, um, we have seen very fast grow in the grow, uh, very fast growing in the fintech industry and in the startup environment. It was relatively easy, to be honest, uh, to find investors um, and to get a funding based on a very high valuation. What we have seen also were high, very high burn rates uh, and a focus on growth, less on profitability. These were, I would say, the observations in the last five to eight years. Looking back to the last 12 to 18 months, the environment has changed drastically. The investors have stopped fundings, uh, just to give you an, an, an imagination about that. In uh, the first quarter of um, 2023, they had 1.4 billion investments in fintechs. One year before the first quarter of 2022, they had 6 billion. 
So you can imagine how that uh, environment changed. And of course, that has impl implications on um, not only on the fintechs, but also on the executives. Uh, we have on the one hand the fintechs that are still managing to get uh, fundings or are already profitable or are near profitable. They are struggling with what we already mentioned very often with a regulatory framework because if they grow and they have grown very fast, they sometimes forget, I would say, to focus um, on, on the regulatory framework that is needed in the, in the finance environment and in the fintech environment. So they have to fulfill those regulatory requirements. That's, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have um, the fintechs that did not manage to get further fundings. And they have to close their business down and, and to, to merge their business. So um, due to that, due to that um, I would say development, we saw, we saw a kind of um, development back to the traditional finance industry, which are offering secure jobs, secure incomes, also room for designing and implementing tech-based processes, um, new processes, but in a traditional environment. So that's definitely a trend that we're seeing currently after the stop, I would say, of, of the fundings. And still the traditional, uh, um, sorry, still the traditional um, finance environment has an immense need for digitalization. So it's really interesting to look at the two of those things. Uh, Philippe, what would you add in terms of uh, trends that you've been seeing you know, over the last several years? Um, I mean, I think one is, um, and that's one of the reasons why we focus on uh, B2B, uh, B2B versus B2C. I think B2B businesses have been doing much, much better than B2C businesses recently. In the vertical, I know the best, uh, which is wealth management, um, being Swiss, uh, that's sort of obvious. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the, um, and now I'm not only really talking about European players, but I think it's the same in the US. Huh? If you look at, um, you know, robo advisors, um, you know, the, the top robo advisors in Europe have maybe collected the 10 billions of AUMs or a bit more. I'm thinking about scalable capital, which uh, probably Manuel Lai knows very well. Um, Nutmeg, uh, Liquid, which is probably another one that uh, Manuel Lai knows very well because they're both in Germany. Um, they've all been struggling to uh, build like a, you know, so solid asset base. And um, I think if you look at uh, the robo advisors in the US, um, you know, and uh, in North America, generally speaking, uh, betterment, uh, personal capital, etc. They're bigger in terms of AUM, but it's still not that big. Uh, it's maybe 40 billion is the maximum. Um, so all those businesses have been struggling. If you look at the B2B wealth tax, um, you know, FNZ, Investnet, um, um, uh, Timinos, uh, Avaloc, uh, et cetera, those business have been, businesses have, have been uh, raising a humongous amount of money and uh, they've been doing very, very well. So I think, and, and this B2B versus B2C uh, sort of uh, dichotomy that, that that applies to other sectors. Right? It's not only a wealth management thing. Um, that's one trend that I see, and I think it's going to still be the same going forward. Um, another trend that I'm seeing, and there are so many that I'll just mention too, huh? um, the, uh, is... Um, you know, crypto that was red hot uh, over the last years has been slowing down massively um, uh, recently, especially because of what was happening in the US uh, from a regulatory perspective, but not, not only, uh, um, um, you know, uh, scandals didn't help, etc. cetera. Um, and, um, and I think the hiring uh, and firing activity, uh, you know, um, uh, it had an impact on the, on the activities of the, the crypto firms. And have been downsizing massively that have been shifting their uh, workforce uh, from from the US to new geographies. Uh, you know, uh, London has benefited, Switzerland has benefited, Dubai has benefited a lot um, uh, from those trends. Um, I think this is something we've been seeing. I mean, I mean this is uh, one of the major trends that I've been seeing over the last years. Yeah. As you think about the uh, the center of gravity for some of this business moving from one geography to another, are you seeing, just a follow-up question to you, Philippe, are you seeing a, a movement of people? In other words, do they do they take the talent from one market and move them because of that? I mean, in, uh, in, uh, in crypto, I mean. Right. Yeah, big time. Um, I think, you know, there's been an outflow of talent from the U.S. to, uh, especially to Europe, because... Um, there's not a lot of areas where uh, Europe is more advanced than the, than the US, but I think the regulatory framework in uh, in Europe is so much clearer. Um, 
uh, Europe, Switzerland, and Dubai again uh, are so much clearer that um, they're really, uh, it's really a clear sign that regulators are supportive uh, of uh, crypto and the digital assets uh, industry, uh, generally speaking. And, and you don't have that level of clarity in the US um, yet. So you yeah. have a lot of you know movement of talent and capital um, towards those more um, you know liberal uh, geographies when it comes to crypto. Great, thank you. And Chris, you get to be the third one. So um, uh, any trends you would like to highlight? Yeah, I, I would say a few that haven't been mentioned, um, and this goes for trends across the fintech ecosystem. The biggest rising trend. I'm sure nobody's going to be surprised, um, is the growth and integration of AI and ML technologies that are being used across all facets of the fintech sector. Uh, and, and that's probably the number one trend we're seeing. A rise in embedded finance and banking as a service. Actually, everything, <clears throat> excuse me, everything as a service is perhaps one of the biggest trends that we've seen in the last five years. So software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, you know, everything as a service really represents a paradigm shift in the way services are being delivered and allows businesses and individuals to consume services without the need of significant upfront investment in hardware and software. Um, a rise in open banking and, uh, and APIs as fintechs and FIs start to open up their systems and share data securely. Um, an increase demand for digital first companies to have improved privacy controls, identity management, data protection, and login security. That's another big focus. Um, and the last piece, I would say remote and hybrid working environments. So co companies recognize that their access to a broader talent pool is massively enhanced if they remove the need to come into the office. You know, engineers and digitally tech professionals often prefer working virtually versus being uh, in an office. And so that's a big trend that we're seeing uh, globally, not only in the U.S.